Welcome again to another edition of the IDS Hour. I'm your host, Paul Honeycutt, joined as always by Jeff Boker, Director of In-Depth Studies. Jeff, we're walking through a, um, I think, a, a rather interesting topic, which is sorting out the will of God. The first few uh, sessions, we talked a lot about the sovereign will of God. How would you sort of summarize that? And then today, we want to start talking about what we call the moral or revealed will of God. Well, let me sort of paint the picture of where we've been so far. Mm -hmm. When we talk about uh, finding the will of God, we're, what we're saying is that any decision that you make that doesn't go against Scripture in context is by definition in the will of God. And then we, we, dis, we examined uh, the use of the will of God in Scripture, and the first use was the sovereign will, and by that we mean God determined, in a way we don't understand fully, God determines everything that happens. Everything is a part of his plan. And that includes evil in a way we don't quite understand. We also examined in the passages that we looked at that when evil is done, those who do the evil and they alone are to be blamed, not mm -hmm. God. He's three times holy. It's a mystery to us how this all works out. But that seems to be the way the Bible consistently uh, talks about it. But that brings us, before we move on to what we will call the moral will, there is one more key passage that's probably helpful to go over and to sort of get us going. It's Romans chapter 9, verse 19. And before we do that, let me just quickly sort of bring everybody up to snuff us or up to speed about what's going on in Romans chapter 9. Because Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11 are one extended argument by the Apostle Paul. And so his argument is this. Uh, up to this point, through the first eight chapters of Romans, Paul is laying out this amazing salvation, you know, that gives us full forgiveness of sins and a transformed life by the Holy Spirit. But when you get to chapter 9, uh, the, the question that's now being raised that Paul will answer in chapters 9, 10, 11 is, what about Israel? Because they are called the people of God, and yet, as a whole, they don't buy Jesus. Only a very small group of, of Israelites believe in Jesus. So, is it, it's as though, is it as though God's plan has failed? Because the people who are called God's people, they reject Jesus. And so Paul has to enter into this extended argument to explain the role of Israel in the plan of God. And that's what he's doing. So in the midst of that discussion, as he gets into it, he explains the famous phrase in 9.6, not all Israel is Israel. He's saying you are making a big mistake if you equate the real people of God with ethnic Israel. They are only a temporary, unbelieving picture of the people of God. That's all they are. And with a remnant of believers. And so, then he explains, the way you become the real people of God is that God has to choose you. So he enters into a discussion on God choosing or election. And it's in the midst of this discussion here, Romans 9, 19, that we have this famous verse. Mm -hmm. So let's look at that. Um, once again, I'm reading from the NIV. This is actually the 1984 version of the NIV. I think this section is all the same as the 2011 sort of updated version. Mm -hmm. So we just want to be accurate, uh, though it really doesn't matter. Verse 19 says, One of you will say to me, Then why does God still blame us? For who resists his will? Now, the point is, if God hasn't chosen to save you according to his sovereign will, then, of course, you're never going to come to faith in Christ, which is absolutely true. Mm -hmm. But, if you're not a believer, he blames you for not being a believer, and he punishes you forever in hell. So, the argument is, and sort of, hypothetically, let's say I'm, I'm an unbeliever, and I die, and I go before the judgment seat, and I'm about to be sent to hell because I'm an unbeliever, and I, I raise a question. I say, just a question. I'm not disputing the fact that I'm an unbeliever, mm -hmm. but while I was on earth, I hung out with some friends who 
and they attended this Bible study, and there they studied Romans 9, and there it was quite clear in Romans 9 that nobody can become a believer unless you choose them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, it is obvious that I'm not a believer. Therefore, you haven't chosen me. And if you, hasn't cho if you have not chosen me, there is no way that I'm going to become a believer. And all of that is true. And the Apostle Paul, when he makes this statement in verse 19, he, he affirms that. He says, well, that is true. One of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us for who resists his will? You cannot resist his sovereign will, the unfolding of his predestined plan. There's nothing that can stop that. And yet, if that plan is that you not be a believer, there's no way that you're going to avoid being an unbeliever, mm -hmm. and yet he will blame you for being an unbeliever. And he will punish you forever for being an unbeliever. And everybody who, who uh, studies this question of God choosing, because mm -hmm. it makes the point that he bases his choice not on anything good or bad that we have done, just God's sovereign choice. This simply reinforces what we had discussed earlier in our last session that the Bible's, the way the Bible handles uh, this subject is that God determines everything from eternity past. This is a sovereign will. And yet, when evil is done, so let's say not believing the gospel message, that is evil, uh, we refuse to believe, that the, the, the very, the blame for the evil is always on the one who does the evil. Always, always, always. And so that's where we're at, uh, at this point. So you, we lay out the sovereign will. And of course, the question that gets asked a whole lot is, why do we spend so much time on this sovereign will? Mm -hmm. And I think that I, I seem to get this question over and over again. And here is why I think it's so important. Is that... Every situation that we encounter, that we have to make a decision about regarding, you know, being in the will of God. God choreographs or creates every scenario situation. He does. This is the sovereign will. And so we have to believe that our God is in a way we don't understand, is absolutely in control. And therefore, every situation that I encounter, he has, in a way that I may not understand fully, he has choreographed that for me. And we remember the most famous verse, Romans 8, 28, in the previous chapter here of Romans, all things work together for good to those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. And so the idea very clearly is that if our God is absolutely in control, therefore for the believer and the believer alone, he promises that everything will work out for their good because he controls in a way that we don't understand fully everything. Mm -hmm. It's all part of his plan. So we then are, you know, when we try to you know, sort out how do we find God's will, the first step is that we understand that every scenario in life that we encounter, our God has put it together for us. Mm -hmm. And now we are then responsible to respond to that situation and make a decision based on Scripture as to what we're supposed to do. And if we make a decision based on Scripture, which we are going to call the moral will of God, then as long as we're not violating Scripture, we are in the will of God. Mm -hmm. That's the idea. And so, if you think that God's in some sense not in control, then you're going to have, and you'll, we'll see very shortly that we're going to have some problems. Sure. So, okay, so let's go, let's talk about the moral will. Uh, that is, Scripture. Scripture tells us 
the revealed will of God. Scripture tells us how we are to live in this world, what we are to believe in this world by the God of heaven and earth. So that's the moral will. I've been reading a book, and I honestly don't remember which book, because I'm reading too many books at the same time, which is I'm prone to do. But one of the books I was reading just the other day made this statement that, when, and I agree with exactly what you're saying about going to Scripture to find God's moral or revealed will, but it doesn't mean that within Scripture I'm going to find an answer for every single situation I'm involved in. The statement that this author made was that there are precepts, biblical precepts, that we find clear in Scripture that we then apply to various individual situations. That makes sense. In other words, I may not know which job to take or where to go on a vacation or whatever the, you know, whatever this issue is I'm dealing with, but there are precepts that will allow me to make an informed biblical decision. Okay, and I, I see what the person is saying. I, I would prefer to, let's rephrase that and okay. talk in biblical terms. Okay. And that is, remember in 1 Corinthians 9, 20 to 22, mm -hmm. Paul is giving his evangelistic strategy. And, and Paul says, to the Jews, I became like a Jew. Mm -hmm. You know, those who think they are under the Mosaic law, the dietary laws, I will limit my freedom and I will observe those dietary laws so that I can share my faith with them, though I am not under that law. Mm -hmm. Paul says, I'm not under the Mosaic law. But, it, but lest you think he's without law, he says, I am under Christ's law. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the idea is that we are under a different version of law in the New Covenant era, which is Pentecost to the Second Coming. A different version. And so what we're going to explore uh, in these next few sessions mm -hmm. is how comprehensive is the law of Christ for our decision making. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think instead of talking in terms of maybe precepts, which is, I understand what he means, right. probably better to talk in terms of biblical law. Okay. That in the New Covenant era, I think biblical law is actually uh, applies to everything one way or, or the other. But we will address that. Okay. But that's a good question. Okay, let's begin this discussion with 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. Because this is the uh, probably the simplest way to discuss uh, the moral will. Remember, the moral will is just scripture, and you could say it in terms of the revealed will of God, because that's true. Sometimes it's called the preceptive will. You talk about precepts. We don't really use the term precepts so much today. Uh, but it says this, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you, in Christ Jesus. Okay, now, it doesn't take a whole lot of reflection <laughs> to to come to, to the conclusion that I haven't done that mm -hmm. this morning as I should have. Mm -hmm. I'm commanded to constantly give thanks. Now, let's just uh, discuss a couple of issues. He says, give thanks in all circumstances, circumstance, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Remember, in our previous discussion about the will of God, we are going to move into the area of Greek, biblical Greek. We said there are two Greek words for the will of God, bulema, thelema, but they're used interchangeably, so it doesn't really help. And it's a context that will tell you which one they're referring to. And of course, the simple way of sorting that out is that if that versions of the will of God always happens, it's the sovereign will. Mm -hmm. If it's what ought to happen, but doesn't always happen, that's the moral will. Mm -hmm. And of course, when we ask the question, what does the Lord want me to do about giving thanks in various situations? His answer is, the revealed will of God, the moral will, is that you should give thanks in every circumstance. Okay, so that's just it's not very complicated, but it's pretty straightforward. So that's so scripture occupies the role as God telling us what we are to believe, how we are to live in his world. Okay? So we've got that. So now you move to this give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Let's just examine that. If I did not believe that God, in some sense, is absolutely in control of every circumstance, mm 
then I wouldn't be giving thanks to him for every circumstance. I would, because he's not the one behind everything. But yet, this passage, among many others, tells us that he is the one, granted we don't understand fully about it, but he is the one who has uh, creating this scenario that I have to make a decision about. Yeah, because if I believe that God is sovereign, and he is in charge of everything, then I'm able to believe Romans 8.28, that everything is ultimately going to work for my good, because I know this Lord loves me. Yeah. So then I'm, yeah, so it does, it, it does sort of flow. Oh, yes. If you really think it through even logically, that, yeah, okay, that does make sense. Yeah, referring back to Romans 8.28, all things work together for good. Right. We know that all things work together for good. Well, that makes no sense if God does not control all things. Right. Right. And we clearly admit the mystery of how he controls everything, mm-hmm. particularly evil. Yes. But we've seen that already in Scripture, that evil clearly is a part of his plan, just mm-hmm. as unbelief from Romans 9.19 is a part of his plan. And we rem- remember that that rather thorny question that was raised in Romans 9.19, for why does God still blame us? Mm-hmm. For who can resist his will? I Meaning you can't resist his sovereign will. Well, then his answer is not some profound, philosophical, mm-hmm. carefully crafted theological answer, but it is, but who are you, old man, to talk back to God? Right. You know, does not the potter have the right to make of the same lump of clay some pottery for noble purposes and some for common use? It's his world. Right. So he, he, oh, he simply says that is the way it is. And he gives no further answer. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and we should say at this point, just to be fair, that the sovereignty of God, the sovereign will of God, that he determines everything before it happens, and our responsibility, both of those issues are clear by themselves. The problem exists when we try to put them neatly together. Mm-hmm. That's our problem. Right. It's not a formal contradiction or an irrational statement, but it is an unresolved difficulty. And so we just want to be upfront about that because God in his being is not like us. Right. Okay. So, but going back to the First Thessalonians 5.18 passage again, we are commanded to give thanks in every circumstance. And it's kind of like, uh, I'm not a card player, but... Um, but let's suppose, you know, there's all kinds of card, you know, we're thinking of terms, of course, the big one now is Texas Hold'em Poker. Mm-hmm. And, of course, then you have Bridge. My parents grew up playing Bridge, but now we're grandparents, and so we're thinking playing Fish with our <laughs> grandkids or something like that, Crazy Aids, whatever. Well, regardless of what game of cards you're playing, let's say you're dealt a hand of cards. You pick it up. You pick up the hand, and you may not particularly like the hand, mm-hmm. you know, but... You are limited in how you play the hand by the rules of the game. Mm -hmm. Well, that is the way it is for the believer. God sovereignly controls every circumstance that we come across, of which we have to make a decision about. Mm -hmm. And we are limited in our decision making by whatever scripture says we can do. That's the point. That's the rules of the game. Mm. It's his world. Our Lord, you know, I know, the God of heaven and earth, he has a right. He sets down his law. We are under the law of Christ, a version of God's law for the new covenant era, which is different than the Mosaic law, which mm. is the version of God's law for the right. old covenant era. Okay. So we're, but nonetheless, the law of Christ limits our options. As to what we can do, and in this instance, First Thessalonians five eighteen, where it limits that we are, regardless of what we encounter in our lives, we are never allowed to not say thank you. Mm. And when you say thank you, it's not just you know this grudging thanks. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe what we do to our thanks children. A lot. Yeah. yeah, you know, tell Aunt Myrtle you thank you for this Christmas gift that you think is. Ugly or some, <laughs> usually an article of clothing. Because mm-hmm. as a young kid, you know, you wanted toys. You didn't, you didn't want an article of clothing. And you go, thank you, Aunt Myrtle. This mm-hmm. is not talking about that. This is talking about a heartfelt thanks, acknowledging that our Father in Heaven, who loves us intensely because Jesus died for us, purchased that we are in the family of God. 
that in his perfect love and wisdom he has brought this into my life. And I acknowledge that by saying thank you Mm -hmm. (coughs) and and truly believing that. So thanks, it it, it takes on a bit more weight Mm -hmm. than what we typically think of it. Because we typically, it's like saying uh, how are you in everyday conversation it has become a social custom but we're not really too serious about it yeah, typically. don't really care don't really care it's just right. another way of saying hi right. whereas here giving thanks we're told to actually take it quite seriously mm-hmm. but that sort of gets us into the discussion about the will of god mm-hmm. as far one, as the moral will one thing that comes to mind in our, our viewers now not just listeners our viewers can see you and i are a little long in the tooth with the gray hairs and all that <laughs> Yeah, or in my are. case, the uh, the missing heirs. But one of, one of the thoughts that comes to me, though, is it, in a sense it becomes easier the longer we are believers because we are able to look back at our lives and see those things we did not understand that unfolded as part of God's sovereign plan and how they did ultimately work together for our good as believers. So it gives us, I think, the ability to be more circumspect. I mean, it's always a matter of faith. But... It, it, and I don't want to say it gets easy, because I don't think the Christian life is necessarily ever easy this side of heaven. But we do have that, that ability. So we're not just talking about little premises here in Scripture that somehow we're just to suck it up and believe and, and, and just move forward. There is an evidentiary kind of an aspect to the Christian life the longer we're believers. Uh, I really think that's true. And sometimes uh, those who are into journaling, mm. you know, keeping a little journal... One of the benefits of that is that, because we tend to forget things, um, is that you can journal and record how you encountered a difficult situation, how the Lord carried you through it, how it really did work out for your good. And over time, this happens repeatedly. Mm -hmm. And we know that as we get older, we have this long, what's, uh, it's kind of like, my youngest daughter plays the viola. Mm -hmm. And, and she had to, uh, started, I think, around fourth grade. And I remember the first recital when she had a private teacher, which she had for many, many years. She had to memorize a piece. Mm. And that was, the first one was quite difficult. Uh, but uh, she's quite good at this. But it, however that worked, she, after, so after the first recital, she had memorized one piece. So her repertoire <laughs> was one piece. Mm. Well, by the time she graduates from high school, she goes to college, she has a rather large repertoire. Well, it's kind of like that, that the more we see the Lord take us through difficult situations, Mm -hmm. and it can be all kinds of situations, you know, health, finance, relationships, you know, like marriage issues, Mm -hmm. problems with children, job, whatever. Mm -hmm. He takes us through them, then we sort of, we sort of develop a repertoire of his faithfulness. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes, I, agree, I wholeheartedly agree with what you said, it becomes then, in as much as I remember that, then it becomes easier to trust him. Because he's proven over time that what he says is true. And that's, t- and of course, you know, in our fellowship, where it's not a large fellowship, New Covenant Bible Fellowship, but we have a lot of sharing that goes on right. every Sunday morning. But the idea is that we encourage each other by maybe someone sharing how the hair is this difficult situation, how the Lord took care of them, and that really encourages me just to listen. I may have nothing to do with the discussion, but just listening. Yeah, and you realize you're not the only one that's struggling. Right. It may not be that struggle, but you're struggling as well. And it does comfort you. That's oh, absolutely. Because you, you know, you and I both know when, when when we're going through a bad stretch, whatever that may be, our first tendency is to isolate, is to back mm-hmm. away from fellowship and all of that, and that's the last thing we really should do. Yes, and so just to sort of kind of summarize a little bit about the moral will. The moral will. This is the other use of the term "will of God" in Scripture. Mm-hmm. This is what God tells us how what we are to believe, how we are to live. This is Scripture. Scripture in in context, and we will call this the moral will of God. So the idea is that we've discussed first the sovereign will of God. The sovereign will of God says that every scenario we encounter that we have to make a decision about has been choreographed by God in, in a way we don't understand. And then we are responsible 
to make a decision, that is to make a decision so that we are in the will of God, and, the, and we make that decision by applying the moral will of God, which is Scripture. And when we began this discussion, turn to, real, very quickly as we close, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17. And this is a very practical section about how believers are to live the Christian life. And it says, Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And the idea is that God's we are commanded to know God's will. And that means His will is objective. It's not subjective. Because it has to be checkable, has to be knowable. And the only way God has revealed Himself in a way that is knowable is by is through scripture the revealed will of god you know and so that's why it's so important to understand that you have these two uses of the will of the will of god in scripture mm -hmm. the sovereign will always happens the moral will what god says ought to happen but doesn't always happen mm. okay sounds good next time we're going to look at I'm looking at our notes here but uh, the moral will in the Old Covenant era, that's something we're going to take a look at as well. So oh. we'll see if it changes during times and seasons maybe. But as always, uh, if, you, if you want to get a hold of us, that information will be at the end of the program. Uh, email address, Skype, phone number. Uh, we're happy to talk to you at any time. If you have questions, you want to discuss this further. Yes, I, and I really do. We really enjoy and welcome the questions to interact about these issues. And please feel free, you don't have to agree. Uh, if you don't agree, just, you know, we can interact. We just handle our disagreements in a way that honors the Lord and uh, have a really profitable discussion. See you next time.